This is Thursday, April 4th, and this is a, a public meeting and conversation. Really? Okay. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, it's Thursday, August 4th, and this is our uh, 6.30 public meeting uh, to help introduce folks to the uh, Cabot Street uh, Improvement Project that will be, that we, will be undertaken this year. Uh, so the prep work you see is already going on uh, out in the street. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to hear some about the project and uh, give your thoughts and weigh in on, on what you think. Uh, so I'm quickly going to turn it over. We have a team who have several pieces of a presentation to share with you. And after that, we'll have time for, uh, the goal is this will be a meeting that ends at 8 p.m., so just about an hour and a half. Uh, and hopefully more than half of that time uh, we'll have for some conversation. So Kevin, are you next? Uh, Kevin Arturian is our chief of staff in the city of Beverly. He's in a lot of ways running points on this project. So I'll turn the microphone over to him and then we get the presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you everybody for coming here tonight. Um, taking your time to, to learn a little more about this project. Um, as the Mayor said, I'm Kevin Arturian, the chief of staff uh, in the city. And I'm um, really excited to be here. We have a really great team who will share some information with you um, during the course of the presentation tonight. Um, our city engineer, uh, Eric, will be speaking after myself. Um, BHP representative Eric Van Eric will be also speaking. He's been helping us out with some of the design and themes associated with the project. Um, and then, as Mary said, we're going to have a conversation about the project right now. And then we'll open up some questions uh, and comments. And feel free at any time, if you're interested, there are along the walls some posters uh, showing some of the renditions of what the, the concepts of the project will look like. Um, I'll also mention that Mike Collins, our Commissioner of Public Services, is here. Aaron Clausen, our, uh, there you are, our city planner. Denise Champs, our economic development planner, is here. Um, Our city council president, Mr. Paul Guanci, councilor at large, Julie Flowers, councilor at large, Tim Clary, school committee woman, Chris Silverstein. Is that it? I think I caught it. Good. All right. Um, oh, Jim Wallace, part of the main streets as well. Um, Sergeant Taché, our traffic sergeant, here as well. Seven Y, our constituent services, um, and project coordinator as well. Oh, and Lisa Chandler from our engineering department here as well. So we have a full team. My brother. <laughs> so I'm just getting right into it. Um, so pro the project. So the city of Beverly is undertaking a project to um, rebuild Cabot Street from Abbott to Winter Street. And the history of that, and why are we doing it, and why now, is that We've heard from time and time again people about the, um, the sidewalks are tired, the sidewalks are dangerous, they're heaving, the bricks are coming loose. Um, there's no real consistency of what the sidewalks look like in the corridor. Um, and it, it takes away from that pedestrian experience when we come downtown. We have a fantastic downtown that's very vibrant. So we applied a year ago for a grant um, with Complete Streets for Air State. Um, which is a four hundred thousand dollar grant. Uh, it's the maximum amount of money they will give to a community that applies, and we were successful in receiving those in this past fall. Um, the team huddled around. Now that we have the money, you know, what do we? What does the real soil color look like? Um, and it was consistent amongst the team that if we're going to do this project. We're going to do it right. What that means is full depth reconstruction of the roadway. And what does that mean? That means sidewalks from basically building on one side of the road to the building on the other side of the road. The sidewalks get down over, the road gets um, pulverized, the curbs come off, get reset, trees get removed, replanted, um, and basically everything between streetscapes, elements, all of it. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, the purpose behind this project is um, we, we talk about pedestrian safety. Um, it's a real concern on Cabot Street. Um, you're very often, like I said, um, and we, we know that some of the elements that will be incorporated in this project will enhance the pedestrian safety and enjoyment on Cabot Street. We're also looking at creating some place safety downtown. 
um, through the beautification um, that comes along with the project. So all of these elements coming together um, is really what the project is today. Um, I'll also say that obviously with projects like this, it's, it's really important to um, communicate with, with stakeholders, those who are impacted. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later about some of our communication strategies around the project. Um, but for right now, that's kind of the overview of, of the project. Um, I'll also say, and we never talked about this, is that we've already undertaken the first stage of the work, which is getting underneath the ground of the roadway. Um, the gas main work by National Grid, there's a, and their contract for Newco is underway. If you drive cash during the day, you've probably seen the truck and, and, and the signs up that we um, these details out there for other people. Um, that's part of this project, but a necessary first step of the project. And some of our team will then come in soon thereafter do some of our work um, leading to a, a close out of the project by a downtime shoot. That's our goal, that's what we're shooting for. Uh, it's an aggressive timeline, but it's one that we, we believe we can, we can hit. So I'm going to hand it over to Eric. You're up. Good evening. So as Kevin had mentioned, you see that there is a large city staff working on this project. All these different staff coming together to put this project together, but it's much more than that. We've had a lot of community involvement at this point, so the different stakeholder groups are all involved to help us with some of the input that's gone into this design. So it's really been a community effort to this point. And now we're happy and we still manage the sidewalks the way we need to be. So we're taking those specifically into consideration as trees that we could potentially keep it possible. Um, the other thing is, on all properties, regardless of if it's city property or private property, we need to blend into that so we have carry money and budget to uh, carry to all those transitions. And third is, um, one of the comments is that, that, that we haven't done a full 3D rendering of that particular location. Um, it's just a budgetary thing. Um, it costs money to make 3D renderings, and we only pay BHP to pick three locations, and that's what we came up with. So uh, that, it's not that we've slighted anybody or we're not going to address those concerns or, or uh, create the enhancements. It's just simply a budget thing for this type of conversation. I think there are two more people who want to have something to say. Thank you for this tree. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions. One on the in an environment where uh, to get on the state transportation improvement plan with a major project and move that project can take multiple years as in we probably project out and the same time, thank you. So, so we, uh, we decided to go after a chunk of Cabot Street through the Complete Streets program. Uh, and that's great, we've got to we work hard to get that money. Uh, it's helping to do this project. It's, it's about a third of the budget project. Uh, and the hope is to do this section and then move out from the ends of it in each direction uh, in another couple of years. Uh, however, we may, you know, depending on how successful we are in getting the future plan, we may at the same time try to get, our, get in line on the tip uh, calendar. We do have other projects on the tip calendar, one that, that we've already been funded for the three intersections, Henry's Golf and Tennis and for the, the bridge. And then we've got the wild side of Bridge Street and intersection of Bridge and River Project. And then we've got, we've got others on the criminal updates too. So that's a part of why we're looking to try to do cabinet in segments without having to wait out the state process on that. Uh, yep. So um, events on cash, we have a number of fantastic events for these people, people downtown. We have Parts Fest, we have block parties, et cetera. Um, 
I've had a chance to talk to the federal leaders, which hosts a lot of those events, um, and we have no intent of not having them. Um, safety is going to be our number one priority. Um, so depending on where we are with the work, um, it might factor in, in some of the decisions and the details around um, any of these events. But the construction times usually seven to three or four, Monday or Friday. A lot of these events happen on weekends. Um, so the site can be tightened up. And a lot of the events actually happen in the street, not on the sidewalk. So if you look at the yard fest coming up, um, we'll just have to, based on where we are in our schedule, uh, work on the details heading into sort of, you know, do the tent set up? Are they going to be up closer and outside when the curb line ends, or is the curb line not in yet? And it can be just as they were last year. We'll work through those details, but the reality is we want to make sure that the events happen. They will happen. Um, in the event that, just for safety purposes, they can't happen in one particular location, um, we'll work with, with the organization that's, that's sponsoring the event and try to come up with solutions to the problem. And I don't foresee there being a, uh, an issue that would provide us with buying that solution. Okay, one, we have one more person who would be raising Okay. Two? Um, you also want to mention it? Yes. No. Yes. Here you go. Hi, uh, Dan Rossman, I'm a federal judge committee. Um, I wanted to just comment on uh, the design. Uh, I know we're early on now that this is a primary share type design. Um, so I appreciate the, the uh, narrowing of the travel lanes, uh, but just wanted to question that number. Um, I know that their number is as low as nine and a half or 10 feet in some areas for slow traffic areas. Um, so have we really considered um, the speed reduction, and if we are going to have a share of um, where we are single files pointed out um, with bikes in the travel lane, are we positioning cyclists in the place where they can keep up with the flow of traffic? Um, and then secondly, on uh, can we just um, consider other types of shadows or advisory lanes uh, in addition to just the plain shadow? So background color or color line advisory lanes uh, that position a cyclist away from the door zone. Those are great points, and I think that there's, a, there's an ongoing conversation we should have on that. <clears throat> Just want to make a point because this came up earlier the question about bike, uh, bike safety. The road today is not wide enough to accommodate bike lanes. So, you know, to, to leave it at, you know, to not narrow it doesn't really mean anything that way. Uh, <clears throat> and I think uh, certainly our hope is that we'll be able to. Uh, sign it properly in, in, on the pavement. Uh, and in terms of whether we're able, we're able at some point to lower the speed limit below what it is today, we couldn't even go after that until the, the, the project would be done, right? right? Because it, again, it's, it's based on the traffic flow as it, as it exists. There's a, there's a sense that most drivers drive rationally, even though some speed, most drive the appropriate speed, and so there's a formula that's used when, when assessing and evaluating what is that appropriate speed, and if you're able to identify that and, and do a study and show it, then you can go to the state and ask for a lower speed limit. So we really need to await, await the project being done and that flow being slower naturally. But that flow is governed by the geography. So this is when we decide that the speed limit of the street is going to be by the construction. Right? But we need to bump up the decking and go into control of what that means for the base. This is the first one. Um, right. Nice. And this is the last question. So I want to in advance thank you all for spending some time with us and just, and just say let's keep this conversation going. We'll let uh, Mr. Collins finish off this, this, this particular point. I'm grateful to be able to share these design elements with all of you. So I'm going to bring you just some of the basic, I, I think it's important to bring you some of the basic statistics about the road so that you get a sense and a feel for what the new scale is going to be like. And it's going to give you a comparison to what the road currently looks and feels like and what it will be once we're complete. So the basic idea, again, this is going from Abbott Street to Winter Street. Um, it's about a thousand feet of roadway. So it's not a long section of Cabot Street, but it's a very important section of Cabot Street. And one of the main design features is that we're going to what's considered to be a uniform cross section. 
Now, if you look at Cabot Street right now and the way it's laid out, the road and the sidewalks kind of meander. It's irregular. The idea behind a uniform cross section is everything gets nicely aligned, and it does some really important things from a design feature, essentially creating that sense of regularity for both the pedestrian, but equally importantly, the vehicular traffic. So once we create this uniform cross section, it gives something that's a repeatable result from intersection to intersection. Something that both the pedestrian and the driver are familiar with as they go through the corridor. So one of the things that's a major improvement, because we're creating this uniform cross section, essentially the roadway narrows and the sidewalks get wider to accommodate that. And it does a couple of things. The narrow roadway really enhances the overall driver's experience going through that corridor, but it creates a common effect, slows down the traffic because it is narrowing down, which is going to help a lot with some of the uh, safety concerns that people have been concerned with over time. Now, with that design, all of the intersections have enhanced bump-out areas, and these bump-outs also um, lead to a better situation for the pedestrians and visibility. We have better sight lines to the crosswalks, and in that regard, it gets the pedestrians further out before they start stepping into the streets. At that point, we're bringing the actual pedestrians into the sight lines of vehicles before they step into the street, and that helps to enhance the pedestrian safety. So if we look on average at the current sidewalks, they're approximately 10 feet wide. And that's pretty much consistent through the corridor. Now, as I mentioned, they do meander in and out, they change from area to area. But if we had to average it across the corridor now, they're approximately 10 feet. With the new layout, we're going to increase the average sidewalk width by about five additional feet. Now, in some areas, it's going to remain the same. There's a couple of little pinch points. But on average, across the corridor, it in sidewalk width of about five feet. And in some areas, we have actually very substantial widths of the sidewalks increasing, most specifically in front of the Unitarian Church, where we're gaining over 13 feet of sidewalk. Now, this design allows us to have three significant feature focus zones, which you will see once we get into some of the landscape design elements. Those will be brought to you by BHP. Um, we knew that this job had to have some character. And one of the main things, talking about the city force that's working on this project, we're doing the design pretty much in-house. We're also doing all the construction services pretty much in-house. So with that, we really wanted to get some good design elements brought into this. I mean, we're engineers, we do our best, but we wanted people that had that visual eye. So because of the um, discussions we've had with the stakeholder groups, we thought it would be best to bring in experts. So we've reached out to BHP to help with those design elements, and they'll talk to you about those actual design elements in a little bit. But very specifically, some of these three key focus zones being the focus in this corridor. So we're already breaking ground. If you look out at Cabot Street right now, you'll see that there is activity. As Kevin mentioned, we're already underway with the gas park. The last thing we want to do is build an excellent road but not take care of the underground infrastructure. So that's one of the key things to this job, is making sure that we leave the infrastructure sound. So the gas company is already in there ahead of the project. Now, because we are shrinking down the road and increasing the sidewalk width, we're changing the overall geometry of the road. We also need to address the drainage. So we're going to put some significant work into handling the drainage now that we're adding these bump out areas and changing the alignment of the road. And then beyond that, we're also doing some watering and lining. So a very important feature for the city is the quality and integrity of our water distribution system. So we're going after our water main and we're going to be lining that. And we'll see some of that work taking place very soon. One of the major upgrades you're going to see is the lighting in the corridor. That is a huge part of this project. So the lighting, again, is not only an aesthetic part of the project, but also that safety element. So a high priority has been placed on lighting design. So getting into the lighting. Lighting is primarily based on what's called photometrics. The photometrics behind the scenes is the nerdy engineering thing that goes on and says, how should this roadway actually be lit? So the first thing we have to consider is what is the true photometrics for the road? And if you look 
look at most major travel ways, a lot of times you use what's called roadway lighting. Well, roadway lighting is very similar to what you see on uh, Manitoula Street or Broadway Avenue. That's modern roadway lighting. So of different scale, of different sizes. So we give you some of these statistics. So roadway lighting style, such as Manitoula Street, again, is the current modern design. Those lights are at approximately 24 feet high to the light source. So when we build, rebuild Broadway app, it's a different type of street. It's not a Rantoul street. We wanted to bring the scale down a little bit, give it more of a residential feel. So you hear us talking about the uh, Broadway lighting. Well, the Broadway lighting brought those same fixtures down to about 20 feet. And when we started talking about Cabot Street, we thought that would be an appropriate design. But as I mentioned, going through the process of meeting with the different stakeholders, we again realized that that may not be the best fit for Cabot Street. Cabot Street needed a little bit of style, needed a little bit of flair. It also needed to bring it down to that pedestrian scale lighting, not necessarily that vehicular roadway lighting. So again, going back to the nerdy, geeky photometrics, we said, what can we do to bring this lighting scale down, but still meet the needs for the overall lighting of the corridor? We found a beautiful picture that has that pedestrian scale. It's a post-top style of light, so not your typical roadway, overhead style lighting, but a post-top style of light. Question in, in Rep, and I think, Joe, sure, thanks. Um, as you well know, there was a lot of effort that went into the original city's bike plan, the existing city bike plan, and, and in that effort, as I understand it, it was identified that Grand Tool Street is the better road. We want to get from point A to point B. Street's the better place for bikes because we had the room sufficient right away that it creates specific dedicated bike lanes. And Cabot Street was recognized as it is really too narrow of anything other than showers. And it wasn't even indicated in that bike plan to put showers there, as I understand it. Um, we know from experience that that section, uh, Kevin touched on it before, but from Pond Street up to, up, up to the theater, that's the width that this road will be found. And if you drive that section, you probably realize, you just go out there today and watch cars as they come down here. As they approach that, they hit their brake lights and they slow down. So that will be happening much sooner than traveling at slow speed. And anecdotally, we know that that's a speed that most bicyclists will be able to filter into the traffic. And you pretty much have to, as you know, have to ride with the traffic at that point. So we believe that this design provides a, a speed that will uh, allow bicyclists to coexist with the traffic as it, as it is right now. The, the volume of traffic is another thing that helps calm down. There's a very, very high traffic volume out here. If, you know, and you see that if, if you live here and you drive this road a lot, you'll see at night when the volume is a lot lower, the speed is much higher. During the day, the speed is quite slow through here. And that's fortunately the vast majority of cyclists are out during the day. And the speed during the day here is much slower. Um, so we do think this, uh, this uh, current design achieves the objectives of making it much more bicycle friendly. I get the feeling, I, I wasn't in all of the discussion, but I get the feeling during the original bike planning discussion that this was almost like a throwaway. I thought, well, just forget it all because it's too crazy out here. This design brings so much order to the road and uh, straightens out the geometry and gets a lot of those crazy things like coming out of, we talked about coming out of the federal and getting the church street, all those things, the geometry tightens up and it makes all those purposeful moves now. Um, if a car can, if, if you're trying to knock a car can slip by you on the right, as we talked about, that's a danger to pedestrians and bicyclists. You have to stop and all of those things add up to a much safer road for pedestrians and for bicyclists and for vehicles as well. So we do think this design it, it is a good design for bicyclists as well. Um, you know, <clears throat> ideal design would be no cars parked on the side, so you don't have to worry about doors. But um, the narrower you get, the more you have to worry about doors. But I think what we see out there right now, given the volume of traffic on this road, which is very high, that this width will talk, will um, accommodate the traffic volume. But then during the day, when, when we have the high pressure device, and hopefully the high pressure device will We don't have that right now, but we'd love to have that. Um, that. That gives us the photometrics we need with that pedestrian scale that gets the road the character that we're looking for. 
And there's a few benefits to all of this. If you look at the um, current design out on Cabot Street, so right now with the current way, there's nine poles with a fixture mounted at about 30 feet high. The poles are currently spaced of about 130 feet staggered from one side of the road to the other, which means that from on one side of the road, from pole to pole, there's about 260 feet. Well, this new design, again, trying to bring that pedestrian scale and character and keeping in consideration the photometrics and the lighting that we need, we've been able to increase the amount of poles and the decoration through the corridor pretty considerably. So the new Cabot Street design will now contain 26 poles at a pedestrian scale, which will greatly improve the look, feel, and character of the street, while also significantly improving the lighting conditions throughout the entire corridor. And one of the main things that we wanted to focus on was having not only the significantly improved lighting throughout the entire roadway, but most specifically um, going through the crosswalk areas and a heavy emphasis on the intersections and the mid-block crossing at St. Anne's. So that's a bulk of the actual design considerations. Um, BHP will get into a lot more of the detail to talk about the architectural and landscape design elements. But I did want to briefly touch on the construction schedule to give everybody an understanding of what this might mean mm -hmm. through the summer. So we basically have a construction deadline to end prior to the downtown trick-or-treating. So we have a lot of work to do in a pretty short amount of time. So right now, as I mentioned, we've already broken ground with the utility companies getting started on their work. So National Grid is currently in, the pro in progress replacing their gas tank. Um, from there, we're going to start working on the drainage, and pretty soon you'll see some activities regarding the waterway and line. That's coming up very soon, I would say within a month. Now, because we have that sidewalk and curb line changing dramatically, we really need to start focusing on what we're going to do with our lighting. So once we start bringing our sidewalk contractor into the scene, probably roughly in the month of June, we're going to start putting in new conduit and light bases for those lights. And that will be a couple of months of solid work to start addressing the sidewalks and, and bringing the curb lines around. Once we've done a pretty substantial job establishing our curb lines, we're going to bring in our contractor to pulverize the road, create the road, and get it to a binder course. We don't expect to see that until maybe mid to late summer. And then from there, we'll finalize all of the sidewalk details, bringing in some of the final landscape design elements, and then hopefully wrapping things up in the month of September. So again, a pretty tight schedule and a lot of moving pieces, a lot of um, disruption through the corridor. However, um, as Kevin mentioned, we are committed as a team to communicate and coordinate as effectively and efficiently as possible. So. Um, with that, I will turn it over to BHB, and he'll talk about some of these design elements. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, my name is Eric Benar. I'm a landscape architect with BHB at Watertown, Mass. And I also just wanted to highlight um, who else was part of this from BHB, which was uh, Trish Domigan and also Jeffrey Morrison Logan as of the landscape architecture and planning department for us, and they were um, very supportive part of this effort as well. Uh, just two terms I just wanted to really highlight again uh, that Eric and Kevin mentioned, uh, placemaking and also complete streets. Uh, these are two key terms to a project like this, and the reason why is because there's, there's a science behind how a design comes together for a public space. And when you look at a rough definition of placemaking, it's uh, a collaborative process of reinvigorating, reinventing, reimagining uh, the design of a public space or place within the community. And so that's exactly what we've done. We've collaborated with the city and we've uh, talked to other organizations as well uh, to really think about what, what is the right thing to do here. And that's also regarding safety, uh, visual uh, uh, sight distances, as Eric mentioned as well, uh, speed, controlling speed, of course, aesthetics, uh, and a whole slew of other things as well. Uh, so there's a lot of things that go into it that really complete a street. 
And when you talk about complete streets, you talk a little bit about the technicality of the certain guidelines you use to design a street, and that comes from furniture, uh, and again, certain the widths of streets, parking lanes, uh, travel lanes, how crosswalks interact with uh, vehicular uh, movements, and how they look as well, what materials you use. And so all of these, it comes down to a science, and they actually work. These are stuff that's been proven around the country in multiple different types of communities. And, uh, and that's what we're applying here as well. And so, you know, you, you talk about the lights, we talk about side of the crosswalks and so forth. I'll highlight some of those. And then again, it's part of the whole process is balancing what we are taking elements of what Cabot Street used to be in the sense of the historic character and vibrancy that it had and how do we apply it to the future and create some kind of bringing some modernistic type of approaches into the streetscape as well. So we'll click to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit more and show you see uh, you can see some actual perspectives that you've seen on the wall of some of our design recommendations. So if we can go to the next slide with that mean? So here we are at St. Mary's Church, uh, which we call Mid-Block Crossing. And uh, you can see how the white stripes um, and crosswalk go from curb to curb. And that's a fairly large distance. And what you don't see here, we're at this particular point in time, which was mentioned by somebody in the crowd, was when you stand on that uh, walkway and you're getting ready to cross, and you have a car that's parked relatively close to that crosswalk, you cannot see the oncoming the oncoming traffic, and that happens on both coming from the north south and the south north. Um, and so, how do we fix that? How do we, how do we create that to be a more safer situation? Uh, and so, when we talk about these mid block crossings, about bumping up the curves, um, bringing in certain elements that actually protect uh, pedestrians when they're actually getting ready to cross. And so, you see some raised planters on each side with about approximately 10 inch high curves. Um, nice plantings that are relatively low, so you're not creating site distance issues from that aspect. Uh, you also have some 12-inch, uh, 12 12-inch 12 square, approximately um, square granite uh, bottles uh, that also protect in case a car does or a truck happens to pop up on the curb. Those are also another protective element. Uh, and you'll also see the lighting is purposely located on each side of the crosswalk so that these areas are very well lit and uh, uh, that plays a very key role. And, and then the other thing, when you look at materials, uh, as you, most of you, I'm sure, all of you know that there's brick, um, uh, there's brick areas all throughout the corner that are kind of spotty in various locations. So we look at, well, how can we actually not so much ignore that or tear it because I know some of those areas are real rough, um, but how can we carry that same theme that's here on Cabot Street? And so we're introducing some of those brick accents as well as some concrete, they call it pressed concrete pavers, extremely durable pavers, technically wise. Um, and those just accentuate the various bump outs throughout the corridor, so the different corners and intersections, the block crossings, and so forth. And then you're utilizing that grid, as I just mentioned, that brings in some of the old historic kind of character elements uh, that once existed a long time ago, uh, and that you see in a lot of uh, historic type of uh, atmosphere. And then carrying certain themes uh, along the curb line. So you can see the brick does stop, but what we do continue is you'll see where the trash can is on the bottom or on the top right, you'll also see the bike baller on the upper left, uh, where the car is they're encompassed by a specific palette of materials, granite, and then some uh, smaller granite pavers within. And that palette continues as a theme. We're not carrying the brick all the way down because it just gets extremely costly, um, but we're carrying a certain theme where there's uh, streetscape furniture along the corridor. And so that really strengthens the strengthens theme along the, the corridor, and that uh, really helps. And of course, identifiable crosswalks. Um, I worked in downtown Frame again when we did these crosswalks and they're uh, talking a lot about slowing down traffic. Uh, as much as they're not a vertical element, they're a visual element that really stand out very nicely in the street, in the streetscape. And that visual element actually slows and warns uh, people driving, noticing that they're coming to a place of pedestrian crossing. 
And so when you look at from a street angle view or perspective, uh, looking over the church, uh, you can see the various elements, you know, the white collar, and then you have this repetition of elements consisting of whether it's street furniture, white collars, trash receptacles, lighting, trees, all of those things create this really nice repetitious pattern. And you may not have a lot of them, but there's going to be a lot of them that exist now. Uh, and they continue down the corridor. Uh, and same thing as our arguments about the lighting. These are spaced very strategically to create an even uh, ambient flow of light across the court. And that's very important, especially when it comes to your eye adjustment. Um, you know, just uh, glow or uh, uh, glare. When you look up at light, your eyes have to adjust. When you look at this, the even glow keeps your eyes adjusted very nicely. It's much more comfortable. <clears throat> And here we are at the Unitarian Church, where I mentioned that the curb lines will be coming out quite significantly. So if you're looking at where the, the uh, UPS truck is or the FedEx truck is, you can almost where that crack is you see in the road, the curb lines are coming out very close to that point, um, like this location here. <clears throat> and so there's going to be a significant amount of space being at this location, which is really, really nice. And we also look at elements such as um, the park over here on the Church Street. You say not as much driving the design of the street street is because of what's happening there, but how can we complement that as well? And so we get into the perspective, we can utilize and carry some of the great seat slab benches into the design of a small plaza in front of the church, uh, introducing some new type of elements, uh, which I call grand seat cubes, these square type of structure that you can sit on, uh, you can't lie on them, which Becomes very key in street state uh, design as well. But they also carry this theme throughout the, uh, throughout the corridor. Again, you can see the raised planters, maybe doing some type of grand accent band that, that demarcates your entering into this little park space, and there could be some writing on that granite, flush granite slab. Uh, and then, of course, some nice plantings uh, accentuating this small plaza area. And this, of course, is where the, the bus stop is as well. <clears throat> and blowing up a little bit more detail, you see how the planters can work. Uh, it also plays into this local functionality, the sense of functionality. Snow cloud, uh, the vehicles that they use for snow plowing uh, uh, can fit up the ADA crosswalks and make them a little bit extra wider. So that the equipment can fit between the seat cubes and the planters, it can fit through there. <laughs> And then, you know, utilizing the break in certain areas where it's not so much where people are walking, specifically walking. Your quarters are all going to be scored concrete. So it'll be easier to manage, snow plow, a little bit more durable. If something does happen, it's easy to replace that <clears throat> rather than replacing these swaths and break. Uh, so it becomes very effective. There's another little aerial view. And again, different elements that terminate the break. There's rings and the light on the ground playing those little pieces of granite that terminate the brick, and that's a theme throughout the corridor as well. You see the little granite pieces connecting the, the cubes to the curb line. Um, and so there's this consistency that makes it very comfortable. Here's Pond Street to the right, and here we have the corner where the pizza shop is. And so this is actually a really interesting spot here where there's a great opportunity where these bump outs can really help with business and thrive where you can do something with this open space and have people interact with the street scene as well as, uh, from a restaurant. Since only you look at this, you have the beach shop on the left here, you have some tables out there, it makes the streets even more vibrant, brings people outside, they can sit and relax while you also have this nice large bump out with all this protective curbing and planters that can make a safer place for pedestrians. <clears throat> Continue the street trees down and we'll continue uh, utilizing the pear trees, which is a really nice thing here in Beverly. I happen to work on the Great Tool Street uh, project as well. And so we'll continue that same thing, this theme of the same species of street uh, of uh, trees. And again, over on the far right, you see some of the grand cubes next to the uh, trash receptacle. And so that's another part of the theme continuing to cool up. And then just a different palettes and materials we looked at that the city really liked. And, and we have these, these particular type of post light uh, top, post top fixtures that are LED lights. So the amount of light that's used is significantly reduced, be reduced, uh, utilizing the LED technology. Uh, and at the same time, it's also what they call dark side compliant. The light, all light focuses 
downward. Nothing goes upward uh, in the uh, uh, or skywalk that allows you not to see the stars. It keeps the dark, the darkness uh, up high and the light down low. Uh, and then, of course, there's an application of the bump outs. You can see some of the granite ballers over this middle picture on the top next to the light fixture, accentuating the crosswalk using a tree planted detail very similar to what we'd be proposing. Uh, something that's flexible is the as the trees grow, their trunk expands. So if we can remove the little papers around the tree as the root flare expands, it creates a more flexible application. <coughs> A little close up of what the granite sea cubes look like over the far right. The pear trees, crosswalks, bike balls, and trash and stuff like as well. And here's just a, a little close up shot, and that kind of shot of those actual type of fixtures. So, this is one of the most innovative fixtures you'll find nowadays. It actually fits the character um, that's more of a historic application. So, we're really excited about utilizing this fixture, um, and I think it will be very nice to the street state. But that will be really good back to Kevin. So all of these work we're talking about, um, I know a lot of you folks here are business owners, residents, and some of the questions you might be asking yourself, well, what are the impacts of such disruptive work? Because it is just that, it's disruptive. And some of our core goals and commitments on this project is that we're going to do everything we can when it comes to construction, to work with the business, to work with the residents, to work with visitors, to make sure that we keep the businesses open, people can still access their homes, the visitors can still come downtown, shop, dine, etc. And so one of the key components of that is how do we uh, ensure our traffic flows in such a tight area that we have to work with can be consistent and move throughout the corridor. And so um, I introduced Sergeant Cache earlier. He's been a part of this working group uh, on our team since day one um, because the, the, the police involvement, the police details, and how we structure those um, detours or tandem um, lanes of traffic. We're trying to squeeze it up so we get to the lanes going at any time. It's incredibly important. So um, we recognize that, and, and Sergeant has been fantastic, and we'll be throughout the project, and look as well as all our other team members who are helping us uh, ensure safety in the traffic and flow. Reality of it is, though, the caption's very tight. Um, we did great tool street, which is sure most of you are aware of um, a couple years ago, the last couple seasons. Um, it was a very successful project considering the, the scale of it. And we're taking a lot of the elements of that and trying to incorporate um, into this project the same, but it's different. Um, it's a smaller work box, um, but it's a tighter work box with the, the buildings are closer together. In addition to that, there's a lot more mom and pop businesses that line the streets and down the street that we have to be conscious of and aware of as we're doing our work. And so going back to what I just said about traffic flow, um, our goal is to try to keep traffic moving if we can. Um, there will be times where your parking will be, uh, will have to be removed on one side, and to both sides. Um, some of the things we've done to try to alleviate that, because unlike your district cash, we have some parking lots right behind where the work is happening and right near where these storefronts are. So we've already put in orders to, for these giant big blue peas to direct your people to where the public lots are. Um, and the signs that take you up from the lot directly to where the businesses are open. We've also purchased business open signs. They're blue signs that we put at any detour or wherever the work as people approach the work zone that says businesses are open. One of the nice things on Great School Street, and I we got a lot of feedback on this, is that because we communicated with our team on the ground with police officers a number of times they somebody who's coming downtown and asked a question, they're able to direct them exactly where to go to try to get to the business. We anticipate to have the same approach when it comes to those disruptions. And we have an officer station right next to the business open sign, purposely. So if you see that and it's trying to get right there, how do I get the officer to answer that question? And sometimes we can bring them right down to that location. Uh, it's that personal touch, that one on one is really important, something we'll do throughout. Um, there might be times, like I said, the parking goes away. Um, there might be times when there's only one lane of traffic and it's tight. Um, and we'll work to try to move maybe one lane one direction first, the other, other lane, maybe there's, a, there's an easy detour that we might have to do. Um, well signed, make sure people can get back to where they go. It's really important that people aren't discouraged coming downtown to capture um, From a standpoint, there's a lot of impulsive heights that might take place, coffee shops, et cetera. So we want to make sure that we can still get down there with the least amount of as possible. 
I also mentioned um, part of the construction schedule, the plan right now as it stands, is that the, the work that's taking place right now, the subgrade work industry, removing the drainage lines that Derek talked about, we're doing the water main line, we're doing the gas main work. Um, when that finishes and um, our sidewalk comes in and we start moving our curb lines, the plan is to work on one side of the road, move the curb, those curb lines, pulverize the sidewalks, put crushed stone in there so people can still walk and access where they need to, while we also work to bring the condo in. Again, it will be disrupted, but we'll work with the businesses and we'll make sure things are signed and safe as people try to traverse through those areas. But once we get to the finish line before the concrete on one side, the plan is then to flip it to the other side. So, in essence, one side at each at any given time would be worked on. That allows us to have one side that's, you know, accessible without any real disruptions, and the other side that might be disrupted, but will work, like I said, in focus and concentrate there, rather than just doing a whole order at one given time. Um, that's our plan right now. We're still working through and tweaking it, but that's what we anticipate from, from that standpoint. The other thing I'll mention too is a lot of the businesses on cash, unfortunately, they have uh, either access from the rear of their shops to the parking lots um, or multiple front doors. And so one thing we'll be conscious of when we're the sidewalks, for instance, when we pulverize and we're coming down the line, is to understand you know, when the businesses are going to deliver, so when the businesses, what their hours for operation. Um, if they're opening up late in the day, um, maybe we can do something earlier in the day that might be disrupted. Or if they have multiple doors, we might pour up to the first door and then come back a few days later or a week later once it's secured in the other section so they can still access one or the other. The details are really important. Those are the things we want to work with businesses with and, and ensure that we have an understanding of their needs so that we can address them on the ground. And it's really, really important to talk about a little bit in the next slide. But I can't under uh, estimate or sell the importance of communication. And that's communication both from us to the businesses and to the public, but also the businesses and the residents to us. We truly, genuinely want to make sure we solve problems as they arise, and hopefully solve problems before they come up. And so I just, I say this out loud, if you have an issue, just let us know. Uh, the guys on the ground, the guys that's involved, um, we have a really great team that's, that's ready and willing and able to, to support anyone who might have some impacts during this work. And I'll also say that, and I did say it earlier, I should have, we've been working on a very tight schedule for this project, and I say we, uh, engineering department, planning department, um, our department, to try to design and roll this project out. And it's a true credit to the, to the talent we have on our team that we've been able to push the needle, move the ball down the field as much as we have on this project. Um, considering how many elements there are of it. So I just want to give kudos to the team. I should have said it, I should have said it earlier, but I'll say it now. Um, it's great work so far, and we will continue that great work throughout the project. One last thing while I'm on the slide. Um, true rule. I mentioned it at the very beginning. Uh, Eric mentioned it as well. That's going to be a really big change on Cabbage Street when the trees come down. And we anticipate that we're going to be doing that in very short order. Um, and so I just, want to warn people that trees, um, due to the work, due to the destruction of the ground, the root systems potentially, um, it's going to be really difficult to save the more mature trees. But one thing we are going to try and do is take the ones that have been planted more recently, the less mature trees, removing them, and then when the project's complete, planting them back in. So we're not completely removing all the trees, in essence. We're trying to save what we can. Um, and there are a couple spots potentially we would like to save some of the more mature trees. But it really comes down to what the root systems look like and what the impacts of, of that and, and probably the construction. So I talked just a minute ago about communication. Um, again, we've been working on design of the road, but at the same time, our team's been working on how do we communicate effectively and efficiently with the public and how can they get information. So the first thing we did is we created a website for the project. Um, the second thing we did is we created a logo for the project. So you'll see on the slide, Cabbage Project logo on the right. That is our project logo. So if you see any material without on it, you'll know instantly it has to do with this project. So hopefully that gives you a little sense of what you're looking through through the so you have a specific interest on this project when you see that. It might be helpful to you. Um, the Cabbage Street Project website is cabbagestreetproject.com. You can spell street with an S-T, S-T-R-E-E-T. Um, we own both of those, and it takes you to the same place. Um, and what that website has within it is multiple things that are, are hopefully helpful to, 
to the to few blue ventures to go on to it. Um, it talks about what the project is. It talks about construction efforts. Every meaningful level of construction meetings, the information we gather around where we're going to be, where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing, will get posted onto the website. You can also sign up for automatic alerts. So you can get an email anytime you put a, a, a construction alert up there. So you don't have to go back, keep going back to the website. You can actually get an email with an update on it, which could be helpful to people. In addition to that, you have a contact us button. That contact us button, you can make that, that goes to me directly. It goes to a couple members on our engineering team. Um, Stephanie Bellotti, and as well as our IT department, so that when somebody has an issue, if I'm not in my office and try to call me, or if the guy is in the street who he can't get here because it's a safety issue, and have something going on, we want to be as responsible as quickly as possible. That's why so many people will get that email if you, if you contact us. Um, it can be an emergency, or it can be just a general question, but either way, we'll get back to you in a very short order. Um, We'll also we have the, the ability to concentrate your first time once. Um, so sometimes, obviously, uh, Commissioner Collins from the winter will send out messages um, saying about parking bans. In the same sense, we can carve out on the map certain areas and direct uh, reverse 911 calls, uh, automated calls to certain groups where there might be impact. So as the project progresses, if there's things that are really impactful, we'll make those calls so people are just aware of it um, as we go through the project. I mentioned day-to-day -day outreach. Um, I've been out on the street personally uh, a number of times, as much as I can be, um, meeting with as many business owners as I can. Um, because the first thing we did when we um, knew what the scope of the work was, we had a website. We started having a meeting and talking to people. The best thing we could do is get in front of people that were coming. We didn't have as much design at that point, but we could say it's going to be over, it's going to be impactful. Um, and we'll continue that approach of knocking doors, letting people know, the local construction team, as well as um, myself and other people on the team to let people know what's going on and to expect. Um, we also have a, a project committee here for some stakeholders from the main streets, the Chamber of Commerce, elected officials, uh, some representatives from the business community, some residents, and we're through Civic Association. That's a purposeful group that we can give updates to so that if people, if you have a question, there's stakeholders, people who have a, um, a network that they can share that information if they contact them. Um, so it, it, it's really important to get some consistent and accurate information um, throughout, the, throughout the project, and that's why I want to make sure we keep the meetings going as well. And I just put my information up there. If you have a question, give me a call. Or just come knock on my door. Um, uh, this is a really important and high profile and impactful project, and so we'll make whatever time necessary to answer questions or help people um, when issues might come up. And then the open for business campaign, this is the last portion of this. Um, we work with uh, Beverly Main Street's Chamber of Commerce and the Farmers Market um, on the Rick School Project, the Money Project, to try to create some, some that ways to help and support the businesses during the project. Um, for instance, the um, Farmers Market agreed for this project, like they did on the last project, to fill up a table dedicated for businesses that might want to have some additional exposure down at the Farmers Market where they have a different maybe audience. Um, share with people that they're open, there's some coupons, whatever it might be. Try to get those people up on Cabot Street, um, incentivize them to go shopping down. Um, and, and the main streets in the chamber are also up on different fronts. That information is actually on the website under Open for Business. It's a button at the top of the page where you can learn more about what those incentives look like. Um, and we're also going to do some business forums um, with the businesses in a smaller group just to talk about what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what their concerns are, and then as a group, hopefully create some synergies where we can solve problems or, or issues that they might perceive coming up uh, collectively. It's a really great thing. We did it with the project. We're certainly going to do it in here. I think that's going to wrap it for the uh, formal presentation part. Um, at this point, um, we, we're very interested in hearing from you folks. Any questions you might have, uh, comments, etc.
given the fact that people are already driving very high rates of speed down the road, the increase in traffic flow creates a real safety issues. Um, my name is Ray Bird, I've got grandchildren who are over all the time. I'm walking my dog all the time. So, uh, just sort of my question is, have the engine been in consideration given how we might be able to maintain the speed and manage the safety of the road on L Street during the construction? Sure. Um, I'll come back to the second question. Let's do a couple things before Bev comes and get this to where they can show it to people. So why don't you kind of recap his comments and question and then we'll start using the microphone. Uh, great question. So impacts of Gale Street due to construction, people finding their way there to uh, avoid the construction that might be happening in Cap Street. Um, yes, it's a reality. Many right? times it's actually people are pointed there, not just on their own to come down Gale Street, but we'll be detouring that potentially. Um, and so we'll, We'll be strategizing on. We haven't gotten specifically on Gale Street yet because we don't, you know, we'll be meeting weekly, if not more, with the whole team during construction, including the traffic sergeant, to discuss um, both the details that are out there and how we're directing the traffic and, and what the week looks like. So we plan that also when we have to make sure there's signs set up the wrong way. But it's a great point if people are starting to go down and they're using increased speed in, in a residential area. We can certainly talk more about you know putting some enforcement down along the way as well. I mean, the traffic, uh, traffic sergeant or, or one of his team members can, can be out there you know once or twice a week or something like that during those peak hours just to make sure people see the presence and slow down. Usually, just seeing the vehicle with the lights on it, tap the brakes. Right. Yeah, not for the for company, just what they're mentioning, just to get people to recognize that it's a residential or a building. It's great. We'll make sure we get a note about it. Uh, just as you're doing that, uh, sometimes we anticipate the cut-arounds and the concerns when we do these projects, but then if, if we don't, let us know. Uh, we do have now two full-time traffic officers on our police department. Number of years we have one, we're able to add a second back for the holidays. And we also are patrol officers around the roads throughout the day, 24 hours. So, we, we are paying attention and we can certainly do some, some more targeted enforcement in your neighborhood. So we can talk about that as well. Great, thank you very much. And, and my following question, and I guess before that, I should say it's most fantastic. We should have started with that. And I also want to give a shout out to Nuco. I know they've been working around town on other projects. They've been phenomenally courteous, very nice, even not only with their disrupting the community, but I can't say enough about how nice they've been and what they've been doing. Um, but my second question, so the, the intersection right at the Unitarian Church, uh, the right where the uh, Simon store is, and I'm cutting across there. Um, that's actually what it, my wife and I walked over here for a week and kind of go right through that intersection. And seeing as that's kind of on the outer edge of where the, the construction area is taking place, has there been any consideration given to how we might be able to kind of slow down folks as they enter that area? Because coming around that curve onto it's quite a race, but it's almost like a challenge to see how fast people can take that curve sometimes. And right now, as it's situated, there really isn't a visibility issue because there's not a place to park right there. So I'm standing on that corner, there's clear line of sight to where I'm standing. And yet I lost count of the number of times that I've almost even gotten pulled over as cars have come flying in there. And again, I would hate to see all this money and everything spent to come up with this beautiful result and still have that kind of race with it. So engineers, we're going to see a bit more of a, of a as the road narrows, there's more of a bump on it. I think Kevin might get that slide back up. Eric, or you guys want to speak to that at all? Uh, yeah. Bev can insist. I mean, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, first off, it's in general, um, you know, narrowing of the road is going to create the situation where the traffic slows down to begin with. Um, but the change in the curb line um, at that particular intersection also changes the geometry as a car enters into that intersection and goes through the crosswalk area. So because it's a little bit steeper um, in the new design, it should cause the situation for people to slow down. Um, it's it's hard to say. I mean, some of those things are you know, obviously difficult. If it's you know truly speeding and truly distracted driving and some of the you know driver-based um, nuances, 
any good road design can't completely prevent that. But we take all these the, the design elements and bring them together in an effort to give you the best net effect. And that's what this design tries to do. Between the improvements in the lighting, the improvement in the visibility, um, the realignment of the road, changing the sidewalk geometry and the bump outs to create you know, more direct, or I should say, um, uh, intentional turns and, and increasing the visibility as a whole, we're hoping will help with some of those uh, conflicts. And again, going back to the photometrics and the lighting design, for the nighttime scenario, this lighting design is considered to be for a highly trafficked main street with a high potential for pedestrian interaction. So the lighting design was specific for a highly trafficked road with a lot of potential um, pedestrian in interaction. And that is a really important part of this design as well. And it's taken into consideration very much so at all the intersections. So, you know, daytime's one thing, nighttime's another, but we're hoping on the average that we're able to make a difference. Thank you very much. I'm sad real quick on that. So just to give you a sense of how the narrow road will be, if you look from former Brown's bicycle shop up to the cabinet for um, Rapture, that area, um, vehicles are much slower there because it's a much narrower section of our cab street. And if you look at this particular area, it's our widest area. A lot of people gain speed coming right around here and they hit that corner. And that's, I think, what you're referring to. And so there's a way it's going to make it much more difficult, much uh, more square, I guess, and higher people for us to open gains of speed. Yeah, I'd like to add uh, one more detail. I don't know if we touched on it carefully enough. And another reason for the, um, the, the realignment of the road and the bump ups, we're dramatically shortening our crossings. So part of the problem we've had to this quarter was very wide crossings and odd geometries through those crosswalk areas. And this new design addresses a lot of that in a number of critical locations. So uh, more specifically, um, you know, where Maria's um, Pizza is and then and now in this particular location. So shortening those crossings, getting pedestrians through the crossing areas faster is also an enhancement and hopefully an aid in better uh, serving the, the, the pedestrians and creating a safer situation. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Just to build on just to build on the Zelda Square. Uh, looking at the layout the other day, I was wondering if there's been any thought to not allowing a left turn on the cabin street when coming up to that road. No problem. So we haven't had any discussions about preventing a left turn, but I can say about that area is that that sidewalk will be bumped outward, um, and that the pedestrian lane will hopefully be away from where the road itself is, and that there will be a handicap or ADA compliant ramp that comes down. Um, with that, we'll hopefully do a few better sales because when we come up Federal Street and Cabot, the, I've heard it a number of times, um, people have a lot of concern, with, um, both from a, a vehicle standpoint, because you see if, where the stop line is, it's, it's tough to see the people coming. Um, and both from pedestrian as well, there's not much sidewalk there where you can kind of come out of it from where the road is to, to have a better sale. So the design will actually improve um, pedestrian safety. Um, in theory, it, it will improve because both sidewalks should be wider. But I, the left hand specific turn, we haven't had that. This yeah, I'm thinking more of a vehicle problem. Uh, you, don't have, you don't have a line there, right? You've got a, a zigzag to go to the church. Okay. So you're saying, you're saying like, I prevent this, this motion? Yeah, the zigzag. Coming out of the church. It's very cross rather than the other one. The straight one. Yeah, it's just an odd thing. That's all. <laughs> More of an impact on vehicles or if you go bicycles or whatever, moving down the road, it's a tricky thing. Just a thought. It's a great point. Hi, I just want to get to the car and I'm sure anybody just misunderstood. So I love this pedestrian safety guide and consent for you and the visibility. So we've talked a lot about narrowing the roadway, um, and we've indicated that it'd be five feet of additional crosswalk. Is that sidewalk? I'm sorry, five feet of sidewalk. On average. On average, each five total of ten, or five total of sure. each five. Each five, so ten. So the road will narrow theoretically by ten feet total. On average. On average. 
And there's some areas that will be much larger, like in front of the interiors, you can see the feet that will be coming out from where it exists in the current line. Um, and certain areas like um, vice uh, camping. Um, And then there's some areas still, I apologize, it's difficult to see. If you go to the website, it's much clearer to see. Um, this right here is about, well, for example, I was just saying, Jonathan, that's going to increase almost by double these are existing sidewalk. Um, down here, it gets a little tighter. Um, I think there's still a net gain, but it's, instead of five feet, it might be six inches or something of that nature. Whereas, again, some areas like here, it's, it's doubling in size from 15. So is that pretty what would be a normal standard size roadway, even with parallel parking on there? Just the way I look at it is a lot of times the parallel parking, you go to the you know, you're afraid one's going to take you off or clip you and you're going to get out of the car. So is that um, the car just to get bigger? They're just bigger. They take up more space on the road than the car can be So have you talked about that at all? The impact of how narrow the road is going to be? So I'm on the hand of the that we support heavily on the actual laying out of the design of the sidewalks and the curb lines. Yes, yeah, so um, the parking lane as a plan here is going to be eight feet wide, which is what the parking lane is today. So we didn't narrow the parking lane at all. What we did is we made the travel lanes much narrower. The travel lanes right now are about 15 feet wide, which is um, observing the, the most common streets. So we narrowed it down to be about 12 feet. Um, that's still more than enough room that a car should not be driving on top of the parked car. Also, that we're allowed to drive the full parked cars properly, and they're actually out of that subject. So, it does allow for a little bit of leeway. You're not just going to get it cramped together, but it'll be about 40 feet per per per. So, it's two 8 foot parking and two 12 foot travel ways. Um, so, it's well within the normal standard. It's actually a lot of times we're going to be even there or across sections like a lot of foot travel ways and stuff. Sidewalks on the west side of the street. And if you look at it from a public 
usage standpoint, the public gathering space, I'll call them that for lack of a better term, including restaurants, uh, pubs, and uh, social clubs, I think is in there. Those types of things are almost exclusively on the east, on the west side of the street. In fact, I think they are exclusively on the west side of the street. So are you really doing a service to the merchants and to the users of downtown uh, Beverly, Cabot Street, by not emphasizing the sidewalk widening on the west side of the street, where these facilities can put outdoor dining, seating, have gathering spaces outdoors, um, whereas on the west side, on the east side of the street, You've got retail shops, you've got two big church properties. Um, it's really not going to be that beneficial on the east side of the street. Now, I understand that that would make the curvature of the roadway more severe. But one of the objectives of this project is to slow traffic and to make it safer. And certainly narrowing of the pavement is going to uh, help to facilitate that. But I would, excuse me, that is in making that curve a little more severe, and perhaps, and hopefully, in conjunction with lowering the speed limit to perhaps 20 miles an hour, can also greatly um, support traffic calming, the traffic calming efforts that you're making. So I'd like to know um, why we can't shift the center line of the roadway to so that we uh, emphasize the public usage spaces on the west side of Cabot Street. That's my first question, and I'll, I'll go off on my other until I can respond to that. Well, that's coming. Uh, so I'm going to speak for a minute, and I'm going to ask one of our engineers to speak. I'm sure which of you it is, but I know we've, we've talked in depth on this topic. Uh, but before I do, I want to say, because earlier Kevin uh, acknowledged some of our elected officials who are here tonight, right after the did that, Councillor Estelle Mann joined us. Uh, she comes with the band of the to Councillor. Uh, part of the project is in the board. Uh, so thanks for being with us. Uh, so a couple of things. You talked about speed limits and lowering speed limits. We're, we're significantly restricted in our local ability to control speed limits. Um, very much it's governed by state law. That's not to say that in the future we might not be able to look at this stretch once the project's in place because things are based on um, the, the typical driver uh, and the average that of speeds. That's kind of, without getting into a complicated conversation, that's the first thing to look at to determine whether it's possible to, look, to lower speeds. Um, as far as the question about gaining sidewalk and which side of the road it can, it can happen on, you know, we would love to place wider sidewalks exactly where we see the best benefit for them from the point of view of, of downtown uh, economic vibrancy. It's not that easy, as you pointed out. Uh, there will be uh, some significant additional amount of sidewalk space created across from here, the block from Abbott, who is it on that side? Oh. oh down here to Fed. Uh, the whole road gets more narrow past St. Mary's around that point. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm going to turn it over as soon as I'm done the sentence, I think, to whoever wants to stand up among our engineering team. Because we have had that running conversation with, uh, with our friends at Main Streets. We're all looking to benefit our downtown businesses. Uh, we all want sidewalk nine, uh, but we have limitations safety-wise and, and performance-wise and how we do that. So it's a work in progress in terms of our conversation on this, uh, but somebody who's, who's not a civilian like me, somebody who's an engineer, needs to share where we're at. All right, thanks. <laughs> so I'm going to give a real brief answer to this, but it really is summarized by, we did spend a lot of time looking at this particular item and this particular uh, stretch of road. Um, we really looked at the curves of the road from a drivability standpoint and also from a sight line distance and pedestrian safety standpoint. 
There's a lot of things that we've done throughout this entire project that we've tried to accommodate the businesses and create the best possible scenario. Um, and everything comes from the trade-off. So when it comes down to the trade-offs at the end of the day, we have air on the side of caution to say that because we can create a situation with awkward geometry, awkward sight lines, and a situation that's worse in general and on the average, we decided not to move the, the curve of the road and push it to that side. So we feel as though throughout the entire corridor, we've done our best to accommodate pretty much the whole. So everything from the best benefit to the businesses where possible, to the best benefit of the pedestrians where possible, and to the best benefit of the drivers where possible. So we've done what we feel as though is the, the best in all scenarios to look at the job on average and come up with what's the overall best design. So I understand you answer correctly. Are you saying that um, making the curvature in that section more severe, which would serve to calm traffic, um, in order to favor the west side of the street where it would be most beneficial to add more sidewalk, would it be a safety concern? That would be a safety issue? I'm not saying that's necessarily a safety concern. All I'm saying is that as we look at this corridor and on the average throughout, we came up with what we feel so the old, is the overall best design for the road. And that's that's where we stand with the design today. Okay, well, I appreciate your answer. We don't agree on that. If I, if I could just elaborate a little bit more. One of the challenges you have is we've heard this comment from a number of sources, and it sounds like it might be the origin of a lot of I also want to volunteer with Beverly Main Street's vision of 2030. So I think I, I, I had a feeling you were the origin of a lot of these, a lot of these comments. And it's a fair comment. Um, and one of the things that seems to be driving it is, OK, there's some businesses on, on the west side that can benefit from, from some more sidewalk. That's where they are today. And one of the things that we can't predict is where will these needs be in the future. And there's, there's a lot of good that happens throughout this whole corridor. We can't everything for everybody all the time. Everything's a compromise. That's, that's any project that has a, has a number of compromises in it, including this one. Um, so today, there are some businesses there that, in that, on that west side, that possibly could benefit from outside dining. But if you look at that corridor, there's no way we're ever, ever, no matter where we put that sidebar, we're going to be able to accommodate outdoor dining of the kind that you might be envisioning. But there's a, a significant number of tables out there. If you look in front of the tonic, all of the widening in that section is happening on the tonic side, on the side that you're talking about. And it's only right in front of St. Mary's where there's this, where there's this odd bit of really wide sidewalk. Well, across from St. Mary's is the bank. Not going to be much outdoor dining there. That's what's there today. You know, the bank's probably going to be there for a long time. Most properties tend not to turn over. Restaurants, uh, any restaurant tour will tell you that. That's a really top business. We're trying to do everything we can to support them in their endeavors. Because that's a, that, you know, my hat's off to all those people that go and say, that's hard for us 24 7 with this. Um, and all, to prove your point, all we would be doing is putting a wonky curve in the road, which doesn't come as an engineer. That's not what we do. We don't just throw away the curves in the road to make sidewalk. And that's essentially what we do in that case, is to throw in a wind curve. Or not even occur, but can't get in the road. So this is a this is a, 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 a properly designed curve that is going to be safer for traffic flowing through here instead of having to make a sudden course correction just to accommodate. You you might be able to get a little bit more sidewalk on one side for a short distance, but nobody's going to benefit from it because it's a bank right now, probably for a long time in the future. Maybe the business right next door might get a little bit more. But if you look on that east side, that whole stretch there from uh, Winter Street, almost the same areas, we're basically mirroring that curve line. And so if we want to give more to the other side, we have to take it from all of those businesses that exist on the east side. And I'm not sure, I don't think anybody on the east side would say they have too much sidewalk right now. So yeah, I totally get where you're coming from. We wish the whole street was wider. Um, one of the things that we did consider, and one of the things that we'll continue to talk about the businesses, to the businesses about, is there's a bump out there that mid-block crosswalk at St. Mary's over the bank. In theory, 
and this is, uh, I'll just throw it out there because this is the kind of thing that you could consider if you were willing to, if the businesses were willing to lose the parking on that side of the street, not all of it, but maybe a couple of spaces, that bump up could be made longer. And then you would have, you know, now you're going to eight feet more or seven feet more of sidewalk on that stretch there. That's a lot. Now you can do something. But that's a really big compromise that you're asking those businesses to take. Yeah, you're not going to have to shut up. No, and, and I don't, I, I'm not sure they're willing to, but it's tough. Without doing something really radical out there, like taking away parking, or, yeah, we've talked high in the sky stuff, like, what if it was a one way? And that would be a total nightmare for a lot of us, but, you know, that's, that's the kind of level of, of extreme changes you probably have to get into to, re to really bring an outdoor down in there. We talked a little bit about parklets and temporary dining. That's a challenge we're, we're willing to explore, we're willing to talk about it with the restaurants that are there right now today. The challenge we, we keep running into with them is uh, if you're we really want to be able to serve liquor, and if it's a park that, that's in the parking space, you can't cross the sidewalk to serve the liquor over there. So it loses a lot of its utility. Great for coffee shop, great for you know, things like that. But if you, you know, that's, you know, the space of your restaurant, that's where a lot of the money comes in. So, right. We've tried. Okay, thank you. It's, if I could, I just one second. Um, we got about 15 minutes left, and I want to see who else has a desire to share a comment or a question. Okay. Um, and, and I don't, I want to encourage, because this is a little trepidation, uh, but because we're tight on kind of Mr. Klaus and our planner, if you want to jump up at any point and share, because we're starting to get into you know, some planning uh, you know, realm here. Uh, if you've got one more question, we can handle quickly less, because then a few other people have won a chance. Uh, I think if, if the professionals are going to be around for a while. Well, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, when, we, when we adjourn, nobody's running out. Well, yeah. yeah.
50 years old. Um, the extremely attractive trees. And unfortunately, some of the sidewalk facilities themselves are showing some signs of disrepair and, and the, the need for replacement. And I had more or less anticipated that as part of this project, it might well have been an in interest and a part of uh, the Cabot Street project, not only to embrace the Unitarian Church with you know, some outstanding uh, improvements, but to extend that uh, plan across the entire area of the First Baptist Church and its area on Hale Street as well. And I haven't seen any plans of that nature uh, at this point. And uh, I feel uh, some measure of disappointment that uh, the detail has not uh, been focused on that possibility. As you know, the church is utilized extensively and uh, it begins really very early in the morning and doesn't end until usually 9 or 10 at night. I mean, this meeting itself is just a simple example of the kind of activity that takes place here all the time. And uh, the facility in the front is, is important to us and uh, I think important to the city. Uh, there are not very many opportunities for that kind of open space and parkour situation. And so my question is, uh, uh, has this not been entertained as part of the planning process for a new streetscape, and why was it excluded? So we occur to building on the storefront. Here we have a different dynamic where some of that front edge sidewalk in front of the front door is actually not city property. What, where is our store here? In front of in front of the houses, who's, who's, who's getting there? I'll see who's where. Because we can we have a side conversation too. So, um, understanding that some of the elements that are out there now are kind of like you said publicly used, sitting on private property. It's really important to get consistency with the design, and then we talked earlier really about meeting about that a little bit. Um, I've been talking with the um, team and the staff here at uh, First Baptist, probably half a dozen times um, to date, and talking about you know what the impact would be with trees potentially, the mature trees there. Um, the trees out in front of um, First Baptist are um, currently causing the sidewalks to heave significantly. It's a trip hazard, it's a safety hazard. That being said, we recognize that they're, they're beautiful trees and, and it's part of the First Baptist entrance as you come in um, that you planted 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had a lot of conversations. We'd like to meet that up for a What we like, what we want to do is though is continue the conversation as we're still, I mean, we've got to a great point where we have this type of meeting with folks. Um, the specific elements in front of the First Baptist uh, or other specific locations where the sidewalk will grow and what elements are in there. Um, we'll, we'll have those more into the conversations around it with the, with the decision makers from the First Baptist and try to incorporate some design. And we've talked about it as one of the key areas where the sidewalk's becoming more significant and trying to incorporate something there that, that fits with the flow and, and the themes that, that we're, we're contemplating. One of, the, one of the things we'd like is to realize your shortcomings, and as engineers, one of the first things we realize is that maybe sometimes we need some help with the design. So early on, we engaged with BHP to help us with some of the landscape architecture elements and help us try to create these themes. And the very first thing we did is we told them there are a number of places in the right way where there are we look at them as challenges at first, and then we look at opportunities for us to do something different. And the first one's here, and the next one is at Unitarian, then it's St. Mary's, and then Maria's uh, um, Finiston Square up at Mobile. So this is included in the first list of things that these are opportunities because you did set the church back, and there's an extra area that we're granted. It's, it's not town property, it's not city property, it's yours. Churches, uh, but it, it, you know, it, it, we're trying to incorporate the churches together and make them feel as one and work together. And when we do our work here, because we're going to be changing the grade of just about everything, we're going to end up having to take most of the sidewalk out right off to the front edges to make it work, you know, to make it all green, to make it all accessible. So it's going to be 
rebuilt and we're still, as you, all of this stuff is still, we're ironing out fine, fine details. So we haven't forgotten much at all. So don't worry. Something, you know, something like we're doing all along the board will happen. And as Kevin said, he's been meeting extensively with the church administration to try to see what could be incorporated here. Because we're always sensitive that it isn't, you know, this is your community in this church. It's not, it's not ours. We, we're not as familiar with it, so we need the feedback from the three uh, parishes to see exactly what would work for them and, and for their current mode of operation. We're obviously prepared to work with all of the planners and all of the engineers uh, as cooperatively as possible to uh, accomplish a, uh, a, a full scale restoration and uh, maintenance of what has been and continues to be uh, the most attractive uh, part of the city. Yeah, I'd like to add just a couple of the details. Um, so, first, as we've been looking at those trees specifically and trying to figure out what kind of a detail that we can um, accommodate. Anyone who has any follow-up questions, concerns, the team will stick around for a little while after the meeting to answer any of those questions. And if something strikes you afterwards, just come down to City Hall and come see us. We'll, we'll spend the time with you if needed to, to walk you through any questions you might have. Thank you.